Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy awesome and we're live folks thank you so much for joining me uh today it's great to have raul bala ceo from imara with us uh raul welcome to the podcast uh louis pleasure to be here thanks for having me pleasure pleasure thank you so much thank you so much I had like we had a lot of um, a lot of messages and conversations around sickle cell. It was the context is it was it's Black History Month over here in the UK, yep. and you know as as some people know, sickle cell adversely affects people from an African and Caribbean descent. And so I was really keen to find someone like you to have a chat with, just to kind of give it some context and you know really find out about it. So so thank you so much for coming in. What's Maybe to start with, what what is sickle cell and what is the history? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is a really um, an important thing in terms of the field because messaging about uh, the complexity of sickle cell um, and the fact that it has been um, an interesting disease in the sense of who it affects, why it affects those people, and certainly um, to the extent possible, the challenges around treating the disease, um, these kinds of uh, podcasts and different messaging help a lot. So thanks. Um, so sickle cell is an inherited blood disorder, as, as you uh, noted earlier. Uh, it's monogenic in nature. And, and, and specifically what that means is there's a mutation uh, in the single part of a gene, specifically the hemoglobin gene, uh, and specifically the beta globin subunit that creates um, the disease. And that disease is autosomal recessive, which means that a parent has uh, two copies, uh, another parent has two copies. You have to get both copies of the sickle gene uh, to actually have sickle cell disease, commonly known as HBSS, um, which is the most severe form of sickle cell disease. There is also sickle cell trait, which is, which is HBSC. Um, the fundamental basis for the disease, which was discovered in 1910, but really in the 40s and 50s, started to gain greater understanding is that the red blood cell, which carries oxygen um, from the lungs to the different tissues, um, has a mutation in it. And that mutation really surfaces when the blood um, just deposits oxygen to the tissue and return back, returns back to the lungs to actually pick up more oxygen. In that process, a circular red blood cell, which commonly dispenses oxygen, goes back to the lungs to get more oxygen and does that millions of times. In sickle cell disease, that red blood cell changes shape and a polymerization event occurs where the mutated hemoglobin is not able to keep its circular spherical form and turns into what's commonly known as a sickled red blood cell. In doing so, it presents a number of challenges for the patient. Uh, the first challenge, of course, is that it does not carry oxygen well uh, because of its sickling effect. Number two, because it's not circular in nature and now is a curved crescent shape, it gets stuck on the way back in capillaries. And that uh, process of being stuck often referred to as a vaso-occlusive crisis or pain crisis um, where the blood vessel is actually blocked causes a number of debilitating effects that compound over time. And those okay. include things such as pain, end organ damage, um, different cardiac problems, something called acute chest syndrome, and most importantly, reduce the lifespan of the sickle cell patient by a number of years, much shorter than a normal healthy adult. Wow. Okay. So, so it's interesting. So your, your parents both have to be carriers to, to ultimately get it. Okay. And then how would you know if you have it? Like what are the actual symptoms? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So it's an inherited blood disorder, as I said. So you're born with it. Um, and and th therein lies some of the complexity. It's not something you can get from someone else. It's not contagious. Uh, it's not something that you contract uh, from being around people who have sickle cell. And importantly, um, because it's an inherited blood disorder, there's often in developed worlds, including the UK and the US, screening for sickle cell. And right. so when you're born, uh, you're, you, your blood is analyzed uh, and they look for that particular issue. Um, but in developing countries, and this is where I think the, the sickle cell disease has a bunch of nuances that differentiate itself from other diseases. In the developed world, sickle cell is a rare disease in the UK, in the US, in Europe. Uh, there's approximately 100,000 people in the U.S. with sickle cell disease, approximately 65 to 75,000 in Europe. But if you look across the African subcontinent, as you noted earlier, uh, there's almost 4 million people with sickle cell disease. Wow. Now, to answer your question about how are they diagnosed, well, oftentimes if there's not newborn screening, they um, present with things such as fatigue, anemia, things that would indicate to the physician that that child uh, is not growing well and or is not able to um, thrive. And those are symptoms that persist throughout their childhood and of course manifest in different ways as an adult, including some of the issues that we talked about. Right, so why, why is it so common in people from an African and Caribbean backgrounds? Yeah, so it's an interesting, very interesting question. Um, there is some literature that suggests or at least um, implies that part of the reason from an evolutionary perspective that sickle cell disease is more endemic in those countries is that um, it was and is, continues to be at least a mechanism to lower the risk of death due to malaria. And so some of those at least evolutionary trends suggest, uh, because I think things are changing, that patients with sickle cell disease uh, tend to be protected from diseases like malaria uh, for a number of different reasons. Now, I think the reality is, if you look at some of the more recent data, specifically the REACH trial, which was a trial conducted with hydroxyurea in Africa uh, with patients, specifically kids with sickle cell disease, they did not see patients uh, with sickle cell disease contract um, uh, malaria any less than right. patients who didn't right. have. So I think some of those evolutionary trends, which again, evolution is such a long span, may have at least implied that there is a rationale for why sickle cell is more endemic in those countries versus in developed countries. Um, but there again lies a complexity around the literature that's not exactly well understood. And, and certainly evolution is not that well uh, delineated, as you know. Fine. So we're still, we're still working on, on really understanding why. I think so. Do we see it in other ethnic groups and backgrounds? Or? Uh, not as much. No, I think you kind of nailed it in the beginning to suggest that it's, it's mostly African, African-American, Caribbean, um, uh, people from Trinidad, there is really a more specific set of patients that suffer this uh, unfortunate disease. Um, I would say that uh, in the beta thalassemia, closely related disease to sickle cell, you do see a difference with uh, a number of patients really being um, driven by Asian subcontinents as opposed to African subcontinents. And, and so yeah. beta thalassemia certainly overlaps with sickle cell to some extent. But you can see population and geographic differences between those two diseases versus within the sickle cell paradigm. Right, right. What, what about treatment? Obviously, you're, uh, you're developing treatments at the moment, which would be great to hear about. But what, what, what if you do have sickle cell, is that, is that for life or can it get treated effectively now? Yeah, so there are um, a number of different treatment options available for patients. Um, I'll say that, you know, the first one for patients with more moderate to potentially severe disease is hydroxyurea. Uh, hydroxyurea is a uh, chemotherapeutic, actually, that's been refashioned for use in sickle cell because it increases something called fetal hemoglobin. And fetal hemoglobin is beneficial um, to 
uh, a sickle cell patient because it thwarts the ability for that polymerization event to happen and more specifically increases the affinity of hemoglobin and oxygen, which enables it to carry oxygen better than that mutated beta unit, beta globin subunit that we talked about earlier. And hydroxyurea works. It's actually a generic drug, um, has been deployed in a number of different areas, including Africa. Um, the challenge is, of course, it has a black box warning, and so there are a number of different safety concerns, concerns associated with hydroxyurea. Um, in terms of more recent approvals, there have been two. And, and is that, so just on that, is that, sure. is that, is that widely available? Is it, it is. It's not, it, it's not widely used for reasons that are both um, real in terms of its, its, its potential toxicity right. and also because of some perceived toxicity that it may or may not have. Um, and so it is really, I would say, a, a useful, but not well adopted therapy. Right. Um, but in at the end of 2019, so approximately a year ago, there were two new approvals in the space from one from Global Blood and Oxprida that increases hemoglobin, so not um, a different mechanism than hydroxyurea, and one from uh, Novartis uh, called Crizolizumab, which is a infusion therapy that addresses a different aspect of sickle cell disease, uh, which goes into kind of the, the basis for the disease, one being the one we talked about around the red blood cell uh, and the polymerization, and two being around bad actors uh, that surround the red blood cell, white blood cells, platelets, um, the endothelial cell wall, who also contribute to those occlusive crises that we talked about. And crizolizumab, which was recently approved, is a P-selectin antibody that inhibits P-selectin. And P-selectin um, higher levels of P-selectin make the white blood cell more, more sticky and it's right. here to the side uh, the endothelial cell wall contributing to those vasoocclusive crises. So in an interesting way to answer your question, um, from the oral therapy side and the infusion therapy side, there hasn't been a lot since hydroxyurea, but most recently, 2019, there's been some, some really interesting and, and new drugs being approved. And I think that's really, those are really important. Yeah. Uh, and maybe the last point I'll just make is uh, bone marrow transplants and a number of different more invasive therapies are available and are potentially curative, but are quite risky uh, related to some of the potential side effects. And those fall, fall in line with earlier therapies that are being developed um, in the gene therapy, gene editing category, which again, have a lot of promise and are innovative, but have potential risk associated with being um, given that therapy. Okay. And what, what are you guys doing? Yeah. So, well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so we are kind of taking what we think is the best, best in class approach uh, by both having a drug that induces fetal hemoglobin, which, which is what hydroxyurea does without the toxicity and uh, potentially has the impact on reducing the adhesion aspects of the white blood cell and the P-selected. And so IMR687 is a multimodal drug. Um, and we fundamentally felt, as you asked earlier, that designing a drug that could be given on a global basis mandates that it's oral, that it can withstand high temperature, that it can withstand high humidity, even if the bottle is left open, can be transported without a cold chain or refrigerated transport needed. Um, and so this drug really, I think, is really built for a global opportunity that addresses both the rare patients in the developed world as well as the developing world patients, which are uh, numerous. In, uh, Brilliant. And how, how close is it to being available? So, uh, you know, we're in development. We're in phase 2B. Uh, and so while we've had some new approvals, I think what our goal is to get to the, this to market as soon as possible. But in order to do that, as you know, you have to run the appropriate clinical trials that both demonstrate uh, a benefit of the drug and hopefully minimal risk to taking the drug. And so we're in the process of doing that, um, recruiting insights that include Europe and, and the UK as well as the US. Great, great. Good luck with all of that. I look forward to uh, I look forward to hearing a further update. Um, one one thing we spoke about off air last time, which which I had no idea about and which was fascinating, which was the, the, the discriminatory practices in certainly the US. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, great question. 
and not, obviously not an easy topic to, mm -hmm. to talk about uh, for a lot of people. But let me try to kind of convey convey my perspective on this across a number of different issues. Uh, number one, I think um, African Americans, at least in the U.S., um, have been uh, mistreated vis-a-vis -vis medical therapies. There is a legacy of testing on African Americans that goes back to the 20s and 30s, um, some of the issues with the Tuskegee experiment. And so there's a, a legacy of, of mistreatment and medical, um, I would say, not malfeasance, but at least medical malpractice on, the, on behalf of African Americans. In the U.S. So you mean those like it kind of illegal testing on African? Yeah, I mean, uh, and when I wouldn't use the term illegal, but I just use the term as a maybe unfair or um, not well controlled and or um, you know questionable design. Okay. Yeah. And so that that legacy of issues, which are numerous, um, has translated into medical skepticism by the African American community in the U.S. and and probably to some extent in Europe as well. Um, and so those two forces at play um, create a nervous and I would say patient population that's very skeptical of new therapies uh, for all the reasons we just mentioned. So that there, therein lies one problem, historical precedents driving current act activity. Number two, um, you know, the challenge with sickle cell disease, unlike cancer or other therapies, is that Patients are in very severe pain um, as a result of those pain crises that we talked about earlier. And that pain often needs to be um, addressed by strong medication, including opioids at times. Um, and a lot of patients in, in the U.S., um, and when I mean a lot, I mean a substantial, substantial number are on medi Medicaid. And so a lot of the... Um, places that they have to go to seek treatment are unfortunately not always their primary care physician, but the emergency room. And right. so why is it, why is it, why the emergency room? Surely, surely if they have this disease, which in the U S is known from birth, presumably yeah. in all cases, why, why do they have to go to the emergency room to get the, the drugs think, that they need? Yeah, I think, and again, it's not all patients, but there, a, a sizable number need to go to the emergency room for a number of different reasons. One of them, of course, they're in pain and they need immediate treatment. Um, okay. you know, you know, the emergency room is a place to go if you're in pain at 5 in the morning or 2, 2 a.m., you have to go to the ER. Yeah. Uh, number two, I think, you know, going back to that medical skepticism point um, and kind of institutional bias, a lot of these patients, as they get older, and leave the pediatric hospitals, um, do take their care into their own hands and certainly may not seek regular treatment um, and regular checkups as, as we all do, and not just specific to that community. Okay. Um, the challenge of course is, is for those patients to continue to see either their primary care physician, uh, potentially hematologist, a specialist. And unfortunately, uh, again, for reasons that are not um, specific and necessarily clear, those patients are not getting the type of regular care that they otherwise may if they were not African American. That could be part of the medical establishment, it could be institutional bias, it could be racist, it also just could be somewhat reliant on the patient to follow up and those patients don't seem to want to follow up. Um, and of course they have a chronic disease that's continuing to produce um, comorbidities and pathology and it's just it's not easy for them on a day-to-day -day basis to do it. yeah being in the u.s and and obviously i mean in the uk and you know we have an, the national health service which which is free is there also a, a kind of a cost issue involved as well oh well i'm not an expert in that um but i can say that certainly seeking treatment in the er or emergency room um, has its own set of challenges um, from a cost basis um, and certainly to kind of follow that analogy um, i do think that physicians are very thoughtful uh, but in a very busy emergency room department um, where they're dealing with trauma and lots of different things i think that the challenge is of course a patient coming in that's seeking opioids because they're in substantial and debilitating pain and that happening on a regular basis 
may create undue or unfair skepticism um, related to the uh, to sickle cell disease. And so, you know, taking a step back as you think about therapies for sickle cell disease, I think you have to address a number of different issues. You know, making sure the community understands that the goal for this disease is all the goal for this therapy is ultimately to help. Yeah. Um, and that's not just done in a quick fashion you have to really build relationships. And that's what Amara has been doing for a number of years, not even related to the clinical trial, but just related to establishing that, you know, we care about the community. The community ultimately drives um, the ability for patients to seek treatment. Number two, to really think about the patient um, in terms of how frequently they have to come in, the type of medication they may want to be on, the types of challenges that they're dealing with, specifically related to COVID-19. So thinking about the patient is the other thing that we've really focused on. So community, patient. And then we have really started thinking about um, education and you know removing some of these institutional biases that we talked about, which yeah. can only be done as, as a therapeutics community. And, and obviously give credit to um, Mara for doing the Real Impact Grants, give credit to GBT for doing their own grant system, and a number of different other companies building out not just the therapeutics vantage point, but the opportunity to really help the community as part of uh, treating the disease. Great. So in, in the US then, and it'd be interesting to, to hear about your thoughts on, on, on Africa, as you, as you touched on it earlier. So if, if you, you have sickle cell disease, you need the treatment. Are there, are there clinics then um, that adults can go to if they've taken, taken ownership of their own treatment, that they have presumably be able to go to a clinic and and someone manages their care? Yeah, and it's a great question. And I think uh, there's a, a number of innovative physicians and physician groups and hospitals working um, with this specific issue. Um, and, and just to highlight one out of UConn, uh, there's actually a sickle cell center where patients would be triaged in the ER and actually ultimately go receive treatment in that specific sickle cell center. And the PI, uh, right. and Miriam, has done a a fabulous job of helping bridge those issues that we talked about vis-a-vis -vis coming into the ED, having a pain crisis, needing opioids, needing care, um, and then getting that specialized care in kind of a, a separate part of the hospital. Uh, and so those clinics are actually popping up uh, in part due to federal funding, in part due to some of the community funding, and, you know, frankly, in the never too late recognition that this is really a debilitating disease and needs a specialized uh, approach for treatment. Yeah. In the US, and you touched on it earlier, the, the cynicism towards, you know, the, let's say the establishment, are you finding that, that people don't want treatment? They'd rather opt not for no treatment than to I, trust it. Yeah, I think it's a little bit, my view on that is they are, I think, maybe skeptical of new treatments, but open to be um, open to be educated. Uh, you will find that the pop patient population here really cares a lot about future generations and helping uh, future generations, um, and they know that clinical trials are a component in that. I think what what companies need to keep working on, as I said, is you're not just treating the patient, you're treating that skepticism that you noted, you're treating the community that's dealt with some of these issues um, that have been unfair. And I think it, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. What about in Africa? And you, you mentioned one of the goals of, of your treatment is to be available globally. Yeah. What are the, what are the routes for people to be able to to get it ultimately. Excuse me, what are the... So in, so in Africa, um, yeah. so in, in the US, it's well established you know, that the sickle cell centers, you know, there's a good good healthcare system, although people need to pay. Um, in Africa, how, do you, how can people get the medicine that they need? So, so for example, for your route, you know, once you've developed and, and all of your stuff's been approved, yeah. like what's the route for distribution for your, for your medicine? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think you'd have, at least we believe, and we haven't quite, you know, worked this out yet, and I'm sure other companies are thinking this too, that the route would probably be a combination of working with philanthropic organizations such as 
Bill and Melinda Gates, working with um, the WHO, um, finding uh, you know a set group that can help us you know dispense this medicine in an affordable, low cost, uh, broad way that allows us not only to you know fulfill the obligation that we've kind of set out for ourselves in terms of treating the world, but to do it in a way that is um, somewhat controlled and somewhat um, managed as opposed to a small company like us trying to do it for safe discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And how, how far are we from an actual cure? Um, so, you know, there are, so there are, uh, bone marrow transplants are risky, but there are, there are tech, there is technically a cure, uh, for sickle cell disease. Right. Um, but, but the risks are pretty high. Um, I would say that we are on the way with gene editing and gene therapy. I think those have the promise for cures. Um, I think oral therapies have the promise for disease modification, but not necessarily a cure. And so I'd say what's great about this field is it was, you know, pretty quiet from, you know, 1945 to 2005. And now I think you're starting to see uh, the fruits of investment um, by companies, biotechs, and larger um, and new innovative approaches like CRISPR and gene therapy. And I think I can't say there'll be a cure for everyone uh, in the next five to 10 years but there will be hopefully cures for several and hopefully oral drugs, which will, we re believe remain the mainstay of therapy, will help patients along the way. Awesome. Raul, well, thank you so much. Um, really informative, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come on the podcast and good luck. Good luck with all of your activities. Thanks, Louis. Appreciate your time. Thanks so and much. Good luck as well. Stay healthy. Thank you. And you, bye-bye.